Hi everyone, we're going to get started. So I'm Patty McCall, the Clinical Manager of Counseling Services, and I want to welcome everyone here this morning uh, to hear the presentation on Stepped Care 2.0 with Dr. Peter Cornish. Dr. Cornish is an associate professor um, at Memorial University. He's a registered psychologist. And he's currently on sabbatical, but before uh, going on sabbatical, for 15 years he was, and I'm going to try and get this title right, and I got my glasses on so I can't read it very well here, Director of the Student Wellness and Counseling Center at Memorial University. Um, Dr. Cornish helped bring in and implement the step care model at Memorial University, and for the past four years he's been providing training and consultation across North America to various post-secondary institutions on how to address their mental health needs on campus using this type of framework. So the timing is excellent because um, I hope most of you know that over the next uh, month and a half we're embarking on getting feedback from staff, faculty, and our students on what students actually need to support their mental health here at Conestoga through and then development of the mental health strategy. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cornish. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was in this region, last time I think I was really in this region, uh, was it 1981 or 2? <laughs> I did a year at Western uh, and, um, and then decided I wanted a smaller, more liberal arts uh, community, so I, I, I shifted over to Trent, but I, I must say that I, I liked the area and I loved London, and if, if I could have had a smaller uh, campus in London, I probably would have stayed in this region. So thank you for, for inviting me. Um, what I'd like to do uh, at the beginning is um, put some of this into a larger um, campus context because I know the folks that are here for this session aren't just in the environment that I've uh, spent most of my time with, which is uh, um, student wellness and counseling. And, and our, our unit is a integrated health, um, uh, medical psychiatry, counseling um, um, center uh, that is also an academic unit. Uh, so faculty, like other faculty, have to uh, to get tenure, have to uh, publish and, and uh, do research, and, and I can tell you that's a challenge when you're trying to meet service demands and and uh, and also respect uh, academic freedom. Uh, how to bring in and how to uh, some pe some people say it's like administration in in, in academic settings, like herding cats, because you know you can't really tell anybody what to do because you know professions and academics have have that freedom, and so so you know I, I think. Um, uh, it was uh, it, it grew organically uh, in in um, on our campus and uh, and it has to grow organically on every every campus um, very different from the health setting so we're we're actually we're rolling out this model now across Newfoundland and uh, coming soon in Nova Scotia I'm working with um, youth hubs through CAMH uh, here in Ontario and youth hubs uh, uh, in Alberta and. And BC, it's a lot easier to, to implement because in health structures, it, there's more sort of a top-down kind of thing, and and so so really, what what this uh, session this morning is about is is how to how to do a community um, kind of project where all the stakeholders are part of the design. So so I, I like that um, Patty mentioned that there's there's going to be you know there's going to be a lot of consultation because that's the way it works best on campuses. So the context, um, this by the way is a um, it is a PowerPoint, but it, it, it functions more like um, a web page. Is the sound okay? Is everything working? Yep, okay, good. Um, the, it, it's, uh, so I'm not going to, there's tons of information here, and you can actually access a version of this. I update it every couple of weeks on um, this website, uh, Step Care 2.0, that you have to see up at the top. That's a blog, and I, I want to tell you that there's a blog because. Um, Every time I come out and talk to communities like this, um, there's a whole new bunch of uh, experts and pioneers and creative people that can uh, adapt, um, make this model better, change it, and so um, I encourage people to, to get involved and join our community practice, uh, uh, post things, post comments on the blog. We have webinars. Um, 
monthly at this point, uh, one for small schools and one for large schools, and anybody can come to these. We've, we have 60 to, to 100 in the larger schools. I think you'd fit in the larger school category. Um, around 100 people attend, and usually what I try to do is bring in some people that are adapting this model uh, on various aspect, aspects of the model and have a conversation with them. That's how the, the, the webinars work so that they share some of their successes and their, their challenges. So uh, hopefully uh, many of you, and it's not just counselors, but uh, increasingly we get all kinds of stakeholders involved in this because it's a moving, uh, it's an organic uh, model, Step Care 2.0. Somebody said, well, would, why, why 2.0? Because what happens when it has to be 3.0? And good point, because it's, it's, always, it's always changing as, as our community of practice grows and we get um, new ideas on how to, how to um, um, work with our evolving communities and I understand there's a lot of growth here you know you're gonna you've got more more students coming in you've got a high uh, number of um, percentage of in international and so being in touch with how the community is changing and having a model that that can adapt is, is something we're finding to, to be useful and I didn't plan to be a consultant um, I did a presentation four or five years ago at the um, the Association of University and College Counseling Center Directors in Chicago, I think it was, I can't remember now. Uh, I had 10 minutes as part of a panel and showed something like this, and, I'll, and then after that I never expected, but people started to call saying, look, we want to, we want to learn more about it. So this, so this PowerPoint, um, like I said, it's not a PowerPoint, don't use it as a PowerPoint because there's 400 slides. Uh, nobody wants to listen to more than two slides usually. So. Um, the way the reason I set this up is because depending on the audience, we can just sort of click on links and look at we can go find material that you want. So the first thing I want to show you is um, is something like this. Um, uh, so the big context of our uh, academic communities is that we we um, we want health, wellness, and however you define it, like health is the multiple determinants of wealth. It's not just the absence of illness. It's it's Everything that fosters growth, engagement, passion for life, um, and, and, and we want to set those conditions. Counseling centers uh, were established in, in North America um, to be to originally not so much to deal with mental health, but to um, cre create conditions for academic success, help people identify what their passions are and, and do well at school. And, and we're finding that this, this model can bring some of that back um, and shift, <laughs> shift away from this idea that we're putting out fires and, and becoming um, uh, mental health uh, treatment um, uh, specialists uh, when really, you know, that should be in the hospital, some of that stuff. And, and so it's a way to kind of bring this back, bring all our partners together. And, and I'll get into that in a little, in a little bit. Um, so uh, we've got unprecedented interest in, in mental health. And I don't know where things are going to go with this uh, uh, provincial administration that you have right now. A lot of questions about what's happening with health. But previously led by some of the federal funding, there was a, a fair amount of investment in, in mental health. Uh, so innovation was, was supported. Campuses are getting, typically are getting uh, a bit more um, investment by administration and sometimes getting dollars from provincial organizations to, to innovate. Um, and. Uh, uh, some of that's uh, happening in the corporate sector. Uh, you know, our corporate partners like like Bell and others, RBC now, wanting to to fund this because it just it, it makes economic sense to support wellness and, and health. And increasingly in medicine, behavioral approaches are seen as uh, absolutely crucial for chronic disease management. So it's you know it's, this is all good news, right? In some ways, but in other ways, uh, those of you in the room that are sort of on the front line around uh, distra managing st distress, whether it's in counseling or whatever, you're, you're now seeing everybody coming in going, ah, you know, I need help, I want help. And, and uh, the good news is that people have heard our message that mental health is important and you should do something about it. The downside is that we haven't actually equipped our community to respond to that in a community-wide way. Instead, the message is pass, uh, I sometimes call it pass the hot potato, send everybody to a specialist. And, and, and that's, while well, that well-intentioned, um, that's not how you develop community. 
and uh, in some ways that's stigmatizing. It's like, you got a little bit of distress, oh, you might have a mental disorder, or you might be suicidal, go see a specialist. Well, most people aren't gonna be suicidal, and you know, they need, anyone who's, even people in high distress, what they need is just someone to, everyone to be open and willing to listen and talk and be a friend. And, and so inadvertently, some of what we've done with this mental health strategy is uh, the message people hear when we do mental health first aid training is um, even though it's care, listen, be supportive, most people hear the message, send to the specialist. And uh, so part of what we're doing with this Healthy Campus um, work is to say, look, let's, let's not panic here and let's support a lot of natural um, uh, um, resources. Uh, and, and so everybody on this campus, whether it be students, peers, staff, faculty, administrators, you can all support mental health um, and not necessarily by referring right away. Referral is in your back pocket, it's something you might need to do. Um, and then our specialists become, um, should, should be in a role where they're uh, not just doing direct service, but providing a consultant role. So that when, say, a staff or a faculty member wants to be supportive of the students, Sometimes that can be too much. You can have some staff or faculty that cross boundaries. Sometimes it can be too little, but they can, they can connect with you to sort of say, hey, you know, um, how should I handle this? As opposed to supporting the past of the hot potato. So I mentioned some of these things. Why have we got um, a, attention, a lot of attention? The impact on productivity. Another challenge though is um, the risk paradigm that dominates our society that basically our whole world is going to hell in a handbasket which isn't true at all um, you know there's less poverty than ever there's less violence than ever there's less war there's less terrorism uh, all these things you wouldn't know by tuning into CNN or, or mm -hmm. any, any sort of news network and so sometimes you need to sort of take a deep breath and stand back and say well there are huge challenges in the world and you know some of this populism that's happening right now I think is a little bit scary where you know, there's sort of a, an anger that's, that's uh, growing around, around the world and, and there's inequities in socioeconomic uh, conditions, our uh, indigenous populations, uh, you know, the risks are higher there and you know, the contexts are such that people are, are, are not as healthy. Um, what, what many of these pockets where there are higher risks um, actually need is, is they don't need more specialists like me. They need conditions uh, to support wellness, they need healthy, all the ingredients that go into healthy communities. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that in, in, a, in a few moments. Um, the other reason we're seeing more, we're seeing more distress and some more mental illness on our campuses is, is uh, because of human rights legislation. Good news, right? It's, it's making um, our workplaces and our educational systems, K to 12 and, and college and university systems more, more accessible. That's the right thing to do. So, you know, if you took a snapshot 30 years ago, you would see less people with um, um, disabilities and less people with mental health uh, conditions on our campuses. Usually the people who, are, who have um, a, um, um, documented disabilities, the largest proportion, if you, if you include ADHD in, into, the, um, into the mix and, and learning disabilities, uh, uh, well, not learning disabilities, it's, uh, mental health is the highest proportion. And, and so, um, so it feels like uh, things are getting worse, but in fact, um, mental illness is stable. It's not, it's not uh, it hasn't changed. Uh, um, suicide uh, ebbs and flows, um, it actually isn't increasing. It, if you, it depends what, where you, what context you're looking at. You look in the US and you take the context of 2000 to now, the CDC just published uh, um, some uh, data that shows that it's increased a fair amount of, since uh, 2000. But then if you take the longer picture, since 1950, it's actually lower than it was in the 90s. So, you know, it's, don't panic, but um, let's, let's just uh, wor uh, work on this um, together and, uh, uh, and not uh, pathologize um, everyday life. And, and uh, so we need specialists in some cares. The step care mo in some cases, step care model is really about um, getting some, bringing a little bit more sense back to to this, um, um, I guess, challenge of making our communities more um, healthier and, and not um, panicking. And I'll, I'll I'll get into that a little bit more in a few moments. 
So we're, we're doing a lot of work on stigma and, and increased awareness. So people now are talking about well, let's talk. We're talking about mental health. So surprise, surprise, people want to do something about it. good news, right? So Step Care says, look, there's lots of things you can do about wellness, and it doesn't necessarily always require a specialist. Now we want people to have access to a specialist. Um, and maybe quick access to a specialist. But that doesn't mean they need psychotherapy. Um, and so what we need to bring into the system is a way of um, allowing specialists to kind of leverage and work and support and prescribe social prescriptions, prescribe things that are very healthy. So for example, the, one of the most important things for somebody who's uh, depressed is activity. So do you have a fitness center here? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I know some campuses, when they're building new wellness centers, I say, can are you, are you also building a fitness center? Because maybe you could just co-locate those, and then you know the best prescription for depression might be to get a peer mentor to, in the medical clinic or the counseling to, you know, to, to, to introduce you know, the counselor introduces somebody to a, a trainer or whatever, and they walk down. And because you know you don't feel like exercising when you're depressed, but if you have somebody and a peer supporting you, so these are the kinds of things we're we're trying to think about: is how do we have partnerships between our our specialists and our community in a way that doesn't burden anyone. You know, we, we don't want to, it's not like we want to, um, you know, it's not like we're offloading, specialists offloading. It's, it's more like, can we do this in a way that everybody kind of likes this? It's, it's, you know, it's, it allows you to sing to your passions. And so that's what I, I spend a lot of time working on when I'm, when I'm consulting. So I mentioned this, prevalence is stable, uh, risks of harm are, are decreasing, and it's really a good news story. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be um, paying attention to, to, to risk, but the fact is that, uh, unfortunately, we can't predict it. Whatever, I mean, a lot of people come in and do threat assessment trainings, and they say, oh, you can always, look, put, you can always connect the dots, and you can predict, and you can prevent these things. Guess what? It's, it's just not true. Um, we, are, we don't have this technology to predict when someone's suicidal. The suicide risk assessments that uh, experts do, if you look at the, uh, the really um, careful reviews of outcomes, uh, there is no not a shred of evidence that any of that prevent, prevents suicides. There's no evidence to say that um, doing uh, risk assessment prevents uh, um, uh, terror attacks. And, uh, uh, or at least in terms of suicide and, and, and mood disorders. What does, and some emerging evidence says, what does um, prevent them is having a healthy campus or having a healthy community where the whole community is supportive. In Newfoundland and Labrador, um, we had a rash of suicides in an in a area called the Brearn Peninsula uh, a few years back. And so uh, understandably, people were concerned, why is there this spike? What's wrong? What's missing? And uh, so they spent a lot of time listening to community members, to users of the system. And we happen to have um, a couple of celebrities in Newfoundland that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, Mary Walsh, I think you see Mary Walsh on par Parliament. And um, of course, Rick Mercer's from there. And uh, another, another person, Andy Jones, the, old, the older folks in, might know Andy Jones from Codco way back when, um, a CBC show. And, and so anyway, all, the, all of these folks were touched by um, mental illness in a very a personal and, and, and tragic way. And in Newfoundland, um, the, the politicians listen to celebrities, they listen to comedians. Uh, Newfoundland's a funny place, right? It's lots of humor, and that's something <coughs> we export. And so, so these voices were really important um, in developing what they call towards recovery strategy. All three parties agreed on this strategy, you know, it was just amazing. And, and so now Newfoundland's actually a tiny little province with not a lot of resources, is, is, is leading the country in, in redesign of, of how we do uh, mental health with these recovery principles, which are strengths-based, uh, empowerment, bringing the whole community along. Back to the Buren Peninsula. Um, thought about, well, let's, let's just put more experts in there. Um, so some of that was done, and, uh, but the community said, but it's not making any difference. We're still, we're not able to get support when we need it. So, um, so they, uh, th there was a plan in Newfoundland to open up in every community, every region, single session clinics, which are walk-in clinics for, for mental health. Um, and in Ontario, you have uh, one of uh, uh, the world's leading sort of trainers, Karen Young out of Oakville, who does a fair amount of consulting on, uh, on single session. Canada has the most single session clinics in, in the world, um, although some of the big names that have developed the theory um, are American, and there's one in, in Israel. Um, 
really exciting work and the community loved it. Uh, this, so what ended up happening, what happens with single session is it's not for urgent, it's for whatever. So it's like your walk-in medical clinic. You, you don't have to, in fact, sometimes they don't want you to go to a walk-in clinic if it's urgent, you go to the emergency. And um, what we're getting from our stakeholders in the community is that was the best prevention you could do because, so before they did the walk-in clinics, there was a six month, 12 month, even more wait to see a psychologist. Uh, so there were hundreds of people on, well, across the province, thousands of people on waiting lists. And they said, look, um, we're going to get rid of the waiting list, and you can just walk in now. Um, now, some people, uh, um, we were worried that you know, some people won't hear that message. So everyone on the waiting list was called and said, you can just walk in. And then when they didn't show up after four weeks, they were called again. And it turns out only 30% of people uh, showed up who were on the waiting list. And then we called to see, well, why didn't the other people show up? And they said, well, I don't really need it right now, but you know what, I know that I can go whenever I need it. So this is putting mental health upstream, consulting with an expert. Um, you can just like you can go to your GP when you want to. And we're so we're, we're working on, that's one piece in step care, but it was one that had a dramatic impact. A lot of campuses are thinking about now that question, how can we, can we put this in somehow? How do we do it? Do we, do we know how to do it? Um, and there's, some, there's a lot of experimentation going on. I'll, I'll share some of uh, the um, sort of experiences with that, uh, with uh, not not with this larger group, but uh, with the um, the counseling team that I'm going to be spending time with uh, this afternoon. So um, sometimes this slide scares people, especially on campuses. So we what we're trying to do is distribute the responsibility for health and wellness, and not just have it be the experts. We don't want to do it where it's a burden. So we, we try and identify champions, the people that already like doing this kind of thing, and equipping people that maybe don't like doing this kind of thing with just some few simple tips on how to be caring to students now and when to consult. Um, and more, most importantly, what we're really trying to do is with our, our students is, is um, share the responsibility um, with them for and empowering them to manage their, their own mental health and consult with us as experts as needed. And the goal here is not, it's not a neoliberal agenda. So some of my social work colleagues have said, oh, this is just a way of saving money and it's just a conservative strategy to offload uh, expensive care um, by not doing anything and just hoping the community will do it. My uh, goal is there's a lot of monitoring that goes into implementation of stepped care and ongoing monitoring for all stakeholders, the clients or patients, the clinicians and administrators. And my goal is we're going to do better. So this is not working if it doesn't do better care, and if it also doesn't allow practitioners <coughs> to feel better about their work, because you're, you're gonna be no good, uh, or a staff or faculty member helping a student, if, if this isn't making their job more in, in, in engaging. Anybody know um, Viktor Frankl? So uh, 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 an Auschwitz um, survivor, camp survivor, um, psychiatrist who uh, wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, basically founded a, a branch of psychotherapy, existential psychotherapy, that um, really um, the, the sort of core, what he learned from his experience was that um, often survival and resilience is, is, is based on being able to find some purpose and meaning in whatever context you're in, and, and so that your passions can come alive. And so, you know, believe it or not, he somehow found that in a concentration camp, found a way to bring meaning and purpose in small little things. And so that's what we're all about in academic institutions. What's your purpose? What's meaning? And if, if, all, the, if all the stakeholders on campus is, um, are having trouble finding that, then we have to develop a strategy that helps. And that's what healthy campus strategies are, are, are about. This one's kind of interesting. Um, so what contributes to wellness? And this is just really a summary of uh, some of the work in epidemiology um, that um, I looked at, uh, you know, some, some meta-analysis and summary and reviews from, from epidemiologists over the past 20 years. And it tends to fall into these categories of um, social and economic factors are, are, are huge, right? And, you know, we often don't, don't invest in that. But taking a, a, a strategy, a wellness strategy, a, a community strategy. So 
the Healthy Cities movement um, started with a charter in Ottawa in 1980, I think it was. Um, and then it started, got adopted by campuses, this healthy campus, this idea that it takes a whole village or takes a campus. That's really trying to uh, set those conditions that upstream are going to um, mean that you're not going to have as much uh, distress. That doesn't mean you're going to have struggle. If you're not struggling, if you're not confused, if you're not stressed out as a student, or sometimes as a professional or a parent, um, you're not fully engaged with life. You know, I mean, it's like it's, uh, we don't. If, if there was no confusion or struggle, we're not really learning or growing because we grow out of out of struggle. We grow out of out of failure. So we want those conditions. It's not about shifting the rigor or making our life easy for everyone. That's a mistake. Um, my colleagues and I probably made over the past 20 years is uh, the whole self-esteem movement. Uh, we actually produced a bit too much self-esteem and a bit too much directive parenting and we sort of made, you know, we thought, oh, we're just going to make this community all safe, we'll build fences and we won't send our kids to that school where there's the trouble, right? You know, and we're going to go to the good school and it's like, uh, there's a bit of a problem there. You, you learn from struggle. That's not to say I want everyone to have a traumatic experience that, you know, is life-threatening and damaging, but but sometimes, you know, this micro traumas are, are, are how we fail, fail forward. So um, health behaviors um, are a, another big chunk. And, you know, that's, that's the habits that we have and the, our lifestyle choices. And, and so public education can be really important uh, in, in circumstances like that or setting conditions uh, where, you know, maybe you set conditions where people have a little bit longer walk from, you know, nobody wants to walk a long way from the parking lot, right? But remind yourself sometimes, you know, that's actually good. I'm going to get a few steps in uh, today. And I remember a, a wellness program said, make your life a little more difficult today. And it, it explained it, but the idea was, uh, you know, uh, that's a bit of exercise. Take the stairs. And so there are ways that you can build your environment to, to support that kind of thing. You can policies that can, can help to, um, uh, for people to um, engage in, in, in in some challenges um, that are good for them, as well as setting conditions for health that allow you to uh, have good nutrition. And uh, so, I mean, there wouldn't be a, as much depression and anxiety if everyone got a good night's nice sleep, um, had a healthy food. Now, sometimes that's an economic thing, right? Because the food most students and people in our society can afford are things that actually aren't that good for you. And again, policy is important there. Um, politics are important in that. So sleep, um, nutrition, movement, exercise, but also um, the natural world and, you know, having natural light and, and uh, you know, I think it should be illegal to put anyone in an office that doesn't have a window. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, I, I, I mean, it's terrible for me. Mental health, right? Yes, I, I noticed that. I was going to say something. Yeah, yeah. This, you've got that nice, you've got that uh, concrete uh, block wall there too. That's, yeah. In some cases, that's sort of the industrial look. It's really sort of fashionable, but. <laughs> so the the one that's sort of interesting, I think, to look at here is this um, uh, the clinical care. Um, so we, you know, this this is why passing the hot potato to clinicians is not actually all that helpful because really those that only contributes to ten or to twenty percent of of outcomes and there's so many other things that I think we need to focus on. That's why a healthy uh, campus strategy is going to get more return on investment. And in fact, built environment, you know, it's it's a shame. I mean, in, in Newfoundland, it, it's it's really sad because um, th they rarely hire architects, so engineers like. Are there any engineers in the room? I don't want to offend any. I mean, engineers are great, but engineers design all the buildings. But architects are people that sort of, you know, they, they kind of get humans, they get, you know, sort of this, uh, they get psychology, they get sort of wellness. And when you involve architects, you're going to get some of this, um, these conditions that are going to uh, promote wellness for all. And it's actually, sometimes they don't, we don't hire an architect because we're going to save money. But actually, you're going to lose a lot of money in the end because you're, not, you're, you're going to forego the opportunities for wellness. So this group uh, called Foundry in BC, um, the, and this is, this is a message, if there's administrators in the room, um, any senior administrators? Uh, nobody that actually makes, <laughs> they're not gonna identify yourself? <laughs> I, I won't put you on the spot. No, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna say anything directly, but it, it was, it's, it's more um, that administrators are often looking, where are we gonna get money for this? And I, 
uh, donors, philanthropic donors, they, they love bricks and mortar. The, um, they love architects um, to make something special and unique. And in uh, this group in, in uh, BC, they have a number of um, donors that paid for the architecture for these uh, youth hubs, for homeless youth, for, you know, basically the, you know, we need to focus on youth. And, and colleges are in that space, but, um, but it's, you know, it's a broad range. I know with uh, community colleges, it's a, uh, a bit broader. Um, and because that's where a lot of these the first these these issues and um, it's where identity is crucial. It's where the struggle that's going to take you from youth to adult happens. The healthy struggles where it goes wrong, and um, it's a it's actually a great way to get good return on investment to to get an architect to build a great space. So Foundry, if you Google Foundry BC, um, a lot of this was designed with youth input. Um, co-design of their model, co-design of their spaces, and um, uh, amazing architecture uh, that draws uh, youth in. And, and so sometimes, um, and, and not doesn't draw youth in to, to make use of expensive services, but draws youth into the community to be part of the community in a healthy way. And so, you know, I think in our indigenous communities setting conditions for health and wellness, um, we need to bring in some great architects. There's some indigenous architects that do amazing work to produce environments that will make communities healthy, but are also drawing on uh, from the stakeholders um, the values that need to be in that space. Okay, so uh, there is a, a plan for strategy. Is it started? Um, Okay. Labs and interviews and like Excellent. That. So there is um, um, an organization, Healthy Campus 2020. It's a U.S. organization. Um, there's one in, in Canada. Um, it's a health promoting universities group, and I can't remember the. We've changed our name. I'm part of it. It started with the Okanagan Charter, which was in 2015 in um, in, in um, uh, Kelowna. Um, there were uh, academics and um, sort of health and wellness folks from all over the world gathered to develop this charter and how we can promote healthy campuses. Um, and so I think we've, we might have about 20 signatories now. Memorial is one of the first um, to sign on. And, 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 and people that sign on to the charter do it in one of two ways. Um, so UBC and McGill, they're very sort of like, you've got to get everything right the first time. And so they did a lot of their planning and their strategy development before they committed and signed on. Memorial, this is kind of the way we do it in Newfoundland, said, we're just going to sign on and see what happens. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can hold our leaders accountable. You signed the Okanagan Charter, you can do better. So that was my, my whole push with this is sign on and then you know, get the student union to come in and say, oh, well, we signed the Okanagan Charter, we should be doing better. Or the faculty union, we, signed the, we should be doing better. So, so um, you know, it's, it's, they're bo they both work. So that's something to think about. Uh, I don't know if there's any colleges that have signed on to. You could be the first. So, are, are you on? No, Humber has. Humber has. Oh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> okay. uh, so what is a healthy campus? Um, it's health and wellness is integrated into the core curriculum, a core mission, uh, maximize learning outcomes, and, and the, it, it's uh, to increase productivity. Uh, so academic excellence is really the goal, and so we don't take away, um, you know, the rig, the rigor uh, of the curriculum, but we, you know, universal curriculum is part of what we try to do. So, you know, I think a lot of you have probably seen this. Are there folks from accessibility disabilities area in the room? Yeah, so you know this one and. And you know this is this is sometimes a hard you know not, not an easy concept for for academics and teachers instructors to, to to fully appreciate that um, sometimes it makes a lot more work for them right to adjust the curriculum and and this isn't this doesn't mean that you have to sort of pander to every unique sort of style because we still want struggle right you know you you're coming here to change to learn and so it's not taking struggle out and sometimes I think what's happened with some diagnoses is and I've been I speak about myself sometimes doing this. Sometimes it's just easier when a student comes in to say, oh, I'll just give you an accommodation. But what we really want to do is make sure they're, they're being challenged and not just, getting, you know, not just getting the easy route out. Take, for example, social anxiety. I mean, the best treatment for social anxiety is stick somebody in a, in a therapy group, right? But if you tell somebody with social anxiety, they're going to go, ah. Because that's a really in, intense dosage of a treatment. And so we got to find the right way, the right balance of challenge that doesn't sort of stigma or doesn't um, produce 
uh, unrepairable failure, but allows people to, to learn through struggle. And that's, it's not always easy to do, but universal curriculum can help. So ideally, blue sky with curriculum if, or with, with uh, um, policy, we would say that exams should be set um, so that, uh, um, let's see, uh, it would take the t neurotypical, if you want to use that language, the person that doesn't have any particular disabilities or processing problems, uh, 40 minutes to complete the final exam, but we're going to give everybody three and a half hours. You know, it might be a bit of a logistical net, a nightmare for the registrar here. And we have any, no, okay, you know, just schedule that. But that's the kind of thinking we want, is why, unless, unless of course there's a program, which there might be here at uh, uh, Conestoga, that where timing is, is the learning outcome. You have to do something fast. So, you know, if, if, that's, if that's the case, we need to have timed tests. But basically all of our tests are timed. Why are we doing that? You know, that's, that's not part of the learning outcome. So, so, I, do you have to, do instructors have to put learning outcomes in their syllabus, very specific ones? Okay. So then when you're designing accommodations, basically you can't interfere with those learning outcomes. You, know, you, have to, you have to achieve the learning outcomes. But if there's an arbitrary sort of rule or requirement that doesn't uh, fit with that learning outcome, then, then you know, accommodations um, can be made. So that should be part of a healthy campus is, is universal design. So, Again, it should be, this is, this is meant to be difficult. Struggle is good. Um, a lot of therapists forget that struggle is good. And recently with stepped care, what I've decided, not, not all my colleagues take this approach, and you know, some people say I'm a bit of a hard ass, but um, I say that, look, I'll, sure, I'll do weekly psychotherapy with you um, if, uh, if you're ready. If you're ready, you know, ready to take on the challenge. And, well, what do you mean take on the challenge? I'm, I've got, you know, anxiety and trauma, and I can take on a challenge. So, well, no, I actually think you can. You know, I think I think people that have had struggles in life before can can. Um, you know, I want you to be be working at the top of your game and think about a, you know, what's the most difficult course at, at Conestoga or what's the most difficult course at Memorial. Students tell me it's organic chemistry. I don't. I wouldn't know what. I don't even know what that is. So, I couldn't couldn't judge. But um, so it's this is like organic chemistry. Um, there's some prerequisites. Um, but you know what? It's a hard course, um, um, and, um, and I know my stuff, and, and I'm going to challenge you. Um, it's going to be hard for me. I'm going to work hard, and you're going to work hard. If not, there's lots of other options. And so, so the student might scratch their head and go, oh, I'm not really sure that I want to take on that challenge, and I'm not really sure what that would look like. So, well, it's, it's happening right now. I'm, I'm challenging you right now. This is the first session in the intake. And so they say, well, I don't think I need that. OK. So there's some other options. We have lots of trainees. You know, the trainees can spend an hour a week with you. And we actually don't allow them to push you too hard, because we want them just to learn how to be supportive and to listen. And so they, they want to try out all the fancy counseling techniques. But we say, no, no, not yet. You just want me to be supportive and listening. And so then the student can say, OK, I'll choose that option. Or I'll choose this online option. Um, or if they, if they kind of like me, but they're not ready, um, sometimes happens. I say, well, look, I'll, you know, I'll check in with you from time to time, and, and maybe I can help get you ready. But I'm not going to spend 50 minutes a week um, being your friend. Because we get lots of other people that can be your friend and supportive, bringing peer helpers into our network to do that sort of supportive thing where people can, can be listened to. Um, we don't, that's, that's a role that counselors always took on because there was nobody else. But now that the demand is up, and there's so many other things that we can do as, as counselors, we need the community. We need the rest of the community to be part of this so that we can really play to the top of our game with some, some of the, uh, the challenges that won't work with the lower intensity. I talked a bit about this. We don't want, this is not about compromise. This is not about making life easier. It's about increasing people's capacities to take on difficult challenges. Pulls on this, um, you know, this idea of stress is good. So you stress, and like a lot of stress, and that's part of, like, sometimes when we're, when we get depressed or demoralized, it's because this you stress is no longer working to 
help us be passionate. And, and in workplaces, often uh, that's the administrator's role to kind of help people to find, just like we're helping our students to find them, what makes them, makes their soul sing. Sometimes we need to stop and do that. So when I'm working with the, the staff later this afternoon, that's going to be part of what I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, try and back up and say, okay, what really makes you sing? You know, what, like, we've, especially people that have been doing it for a long, long time, sometimes we're just sort of going through the motions and we need something to kind of say, wow, you know, this is really exciting. So if, if it's not for you, then, then, then it's not going to, it's not going to be, um, you know, making a big uh, difference in the world uh, for the people that you work with. Okay, so this is what we're going to be talking about with the other staff later on, this model. Um, this is the way we configured it at Memorial. Uh, these um, dimensions, a lot, of, a lot of places that I work with, they configure it very differently. They don't like the hierarchy and all that kind of thing. That's fine. You can, you can change it. You can make it a circle or whatever. I usually always uh, introduce it this way because um, the idea is that uh, on these dimensions are our values. So we want our students to be uh, autonomous, to, to be empowered, to be able to manage their lives, to be able to manage their health. Um, so that's one of the dimensions. We, we really, if, if we can do something low intensity that's empowering, great. It's not offloading. It's like, can, is there a way we can get you to do this yourself, that you're in charge? Um, and if not, we can step up. Uh, the other thing that's different about this model is, is it's not about um, you give high intensity supports to people who are um, more ill. Because often people who are more ill um, are, uh, may not be ready to use those resources, or um, they, they could benefit even more from low intensity. So take, for example, someone that's um, maybe had a psychotic break, or um, what do we often do with people that, have, that are unstable? Uh, we put them in the hospital. Um, and we do that because you know it's it, you know they need to be stabilized. But often those hospital environments aren't terribly healing, right? And and so sometimes the best thing for somebody who's really got a severe illness is to be connected with a peer, one of their peers. That's a low intensity intervention. And yet what we often think about when when med uh, and my medical colleagues will often go through these protocols. Well, we'll we'll give a low intensity if their depression score is low, and we'll give a high intensity treatment if their depression score is high. And we try to get away from that. What are people ready for? What are they ready to kind of take on that will um, get them functioning a bit better? Um, so when someone comes in, and this is why the walk-in idea works well, is is um, single session uh, is is a name of, of a type of therapy, and it's a misnomer. And books have been published by uh, Mosh Talman and Michael Hoyt. And they, um, Talman was interviewed uh, a number of times and was asked, why do you call it single session? He said, well, my publisher made me do it because it would sell more books. I didn't really want to call it that. It's, it's really, it's, it's a sort of therapy one at a time sessions. Uh, just like when you go to your GP, you don't, you, know, you don't have to, when you go to your GP, you don't have to sign up for 16 sessions. And you're not gonna, you're, you don't go to your physician necessarily to fix everything that's wrong with you. You go in with you know, whatever's on your mind today that you want to work on. Now, of course, the physician's job is to also see if there's something that's, that's um, perhaps more chronic and serious that you need to capture and, and need to do more work on. But our, in mental health, we've typically said, oh, well, you meet this criteria score, we're going to put you in a course like chemotherapy and we're going to cure you. Well, in fact, that never happens. That's not what we do. Um, and so this idea of sort of, of, of one at a time is, um, uh, allows you, and the title of Hoyt and Tolman's most recent book is um, Capturing the Moment. So when someone says, help, we could say, oh, my job as a professional is to say, um, is to do all kinds of deep assessment to figure out what the real issue is. Or I can say, what can I help you with? I can trust that people kind of know when they're calling you, there's probably something that they're ready to do. And the single session approach says, tries to get down to, well, what's the most important thing right now? And you know what? In, by the end of this hour, I would like you to walk away with a sense that you've, uh, this, was, this time was well spent and something happened today with respect to that thing that is most important to you today. That doesn't mean you can't come back because it's not really single session. You can come back and work on another thing. Now, sometimes that's not enough, right? And that's fine. Then we can, we can go into more intensive traditional therapy after that. But that's, that's the kind of thinking 
um, that underlies and makes this a bit different when we're trying to tap into readiness. When someone calls and says help, they're ready to do something. Let's tap into that. Maybe they need more, but let's tap into what they're ready to do. And then, uh, and then we also have to be honest about resources that are scarce and resources that are plentiful. So psychiatrists are hard to find, right? And so we can't send everybody to a psychiatrist. Um, now, we could pour lots of money and hire a whole bunch more, and that would be nice. And maybe we need to do that. I'm not saying don't. But I'm saying there's a problem with that, because it, it then puts resources into things that don't empower people necessarily, because it's just it's sort of setting up this idea that, well, just put more specialists for people to go to so that the, speci so the specialists can help them, versus setting the conditions for the community to help itself. So often these um, expensive resources don't produce a lot of return on investment. Whereas if you invest in a better community, your return is going to be greater. Um, so that's, and we've always talked about health promotion and, and setting these conditions, but we pay lip service to it and our medical system still funds the specialists, which allows us to do reactive work. And that's good, but we need to build more of the low intensity. And then our professionals can shift their role to be the, the help be the architects of this. So counselors can be the ones that help the campus or the community to set this up, to sort of oversee some of this. So, so if, if sometimes counselors are worried that, oh my god, I'm, there's going to be no work left for me. What about my job? No, you're, we need you to make sure this whole thing is working well, because you, you kind of, you're, the, you're the experts on uh, when low and when high intensity is needed. So you become consultants in that, in that way. I'm just going to skip ahead now to the. Uh, 9.47. What's the, how much time do we have for this? Until 10.30. Until 10.30. Okay. So um, before I go into the step care model a little bit, I just thought um, maybe for uh, five minutes or so, um, if, somebody, if you could just keep an eye on the five minutes. Just, just if there are any questions uh, at this point, just interrupt a little bit the flow. Observations, comments, fears. <laughs> No? Yes? So can I make an assumption not knowing the full history yes. of your institution that you may have had a more traditional model and have now moved into something like that? Yes. And I can't imagine that everybody um, showed up and said, yay, we've been waiting nope. for this. And so um, maybe you could speak a little bit to how the process that challenged yeah. people and how you were able to make that shift. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question was, um, you know, sort of how did this uh, originate and how did how did you bring about a change and you know some people are excited and some people um, you know maybe weren't so excited about it and and so how do you how do you kind of navigate that um, the the, f the most important thing is this uh, what do our stakeholders what do our um, our what does our population uh, think and and want what I find is that most often um, the say the students in this case when you explain this to them they go great. Amazing. Um, the uh, administrators go, hmm, makes sense. Um, people like me and my colleagues go, what the hell? You know, like, this feels like a threat. You know, like, and, and so, so, so that's, um, and, it, and, it, and it, it varies from uh, community to community. And so that's why the first approach that I often take is to work with the folks that are going to be most involved in this change so that they're the architects or they're the overseers of it. And you bring in all these partners. So that's why I wanted a broad audience here. Are there students here tonight? No, because they're all, yes, great. So, you know, having students involved in this design, thank you, <laughs> um, is, is, is crucial. But um, we have to remember that the folks that have, have kind of been responsible and have um, um, got, got a lot of training and put their heart and soul into this and sometimes burnt out from all this, you know, it's, this is hard work, that uh, we have to uh, give them a central design role and um, allow them to find how to make it work for them too. So um, this, is, this is not about, it doesn't work um, top down. But it does. But it does need. It does need um, administrative buy-in, both to support the, maybe some of the struggle that, that will happen as you're designing it. Um, uh, and it's not. It's not about saving money. It, uh, I always say that uh, right now we're wanting to invest. We need to invest more in wellness. But it's about being really thoughtful about 
um, where does that money go? And, and so turf stuff will come up. Well, wait a minute, it's not going to more counselors? Well, that's not right. So, um, so it's, it's, it's not so much who does the money go to, it's, it's are, are we doing um, the kind of work that is going to have the biggest impact, both for us and our identity as providers, um, and, or are there different ways to do it? And so built into this is this, um, people say don't call it a pilot uh, because, and I get why we, we don't want to call it a pilot because pilots fail when a great idea comes along and it's funded and then there's no sustainability. Part of the strategy of involving a whole community is guess what, if you start doing something that people like, you, you're, not gonna, no, you're not gonna be able to stop it. Right? No, you won't be allowed to stop it because your community is gonna say we have to keep doing this. So, so when I use the word pilot, I say it's, it's kind of like what we're trying to do in the academic setting is uh, fail forward. I mean, f f failing a test can be the best thing that ever happened to you if it's supported well, because that's when things, that's when learning happens. Some of my biggest um, um, uh, turning points in my life were, were, were through failures that then allowed me to see opportunities. Um, so, so having it be a series of pilots where we, we oh, let's try something new and let's, let's together see how it works. And you know what, if it doesn't work, it doesn't mean we stop trying. It means, okay, so what do we need to do differently to make it work? Um, We've started these uh, groups called um, client design teams, or uh, student design teams, and it, uh, it happened organically in a couple of ways at Memorial. One was um, some of the students that we've been seeing long term um, for ongoing therapy, sometimes with really um, multiple diagnoses, sometimes personality disorders. Um, as we started to monitor use, use, using methods where both the student and the clinician could sort of see, track and see how things are going and whether things are improving, we, for these students, we'd see no, there'd be no progress. And they'd say, well, but I need this. This is my lifeline. If you stop this, I will die, literally. And I say, oh, well, I don't want that to happen. So, but you know what? I actually want more for you than just this. So let's start thinking how we could, what else could we do? And this client design team came up where, um, because we had a new model being developed and we wanted stakeholder input, we said, look, we, we want you to, to help us with this. And so some of these students that weren't making progress, we said, do you want to be part of this design team? Because you might be able to help figure out you know, how we could restructure our services. And the interesting thing is, you give somebody like this kind of a meaningful job like this, that was healing for them. Um, it didn't necessarily um, directly impact what they were doing in therapy, but many of them said, you know what, I don't really need therapy anymore because I'm, I'm actually finding this really rewarding being part of this design team and I'm part of a peer network. And, and one of the people that had a personality disorder said, how can I help people? I can't manage my own emotions and feelings and relationships are a total failure. I said, well, but you've told me all the time people come to you, your friends come to you, people come to you and they talk about feelings. Okay, so um, I trained this person to be a peer helper. Um, and to do some online peer helping, loved it. Developed skills, actually, because you, know, you start um, learning listening skills, you start learning how to regulate your feelings. And so that was one group that went to this design team. The other group were the people that, that hated um, some of the changes. So in addition to or stepped care evolving, at the same time we merged our um, medical clinic with counseling. And the longer term clients, the, friends of our center, we <laughs> sometimes call them that. And, and, I, and I mean that um, with all respect because counselors love, part of what's difficult for sometimes for counselors, we love working with people that we get to know, you know, and it's sort of, you know, we've had this relationship, we'll keep working with them, and so doing short term can feel like a, a threat to some of that. And um, so they, with this merger, the waiting room became noisy with babies crying and it just, uh, there was music in there and there were lots of complaints about the waiting room and why are we doing this. And so I learned as an administrator, whenever anyone makes a complaint, is to invite them in immediately. Um, hear that complaint and say, um, how should we fix it? And, oh, and even better yet, um, can, can you come on the team to fix it for, for us? And it's amazing what happens, right? Because the ones that are just making a lot of noise and hoping that you will change the world for them, they just become silent and they leave and you don't hear from them anymore. And the other ones are coming in, they actually join the team and they say, and so this waiting room thing, I mean, they, 
what was valuable was how empowering it was for them to be part of the process. Um, it's not like they dramatically changed the waiting room. We couldn't go back to where we were before, but they said, let's put some plants in there. Let's get rid of the music. We'll put in sound masking. Um, can we have a secondary place for people that are in distress? And oh, why don't we bring peer helpers into the waiting room? And sometimes they can greet people who are in distress. So, so that's the beauty of involving um, campus. And then, and then the counselor's role becomes kind of like um, you know, the director of the play or the music director. We've we got to keep all this all this working. And now that doesn't work for all counselors because not all counselors want to be directors of plays, you know, and many of them are introverts. And so we have to find a way to adapt this model so that it works for the community. And, a, and but not, but there, there are a few, there are some principles that we put in play that are kind of non-negotiable. And some of those are, and I'll talk with the um, counseling crowd later on, recovery principles that have all these values of empowerment. Um, some of those are non-negotiable, but how we configure it, that's got to do with what the capacities are of the community. <coughs> Any other questions? Or we can, maybe we'll hold those for the end. I'll just go through a little more content. Uh, so basic step care, not new. Are there uh, nurses, medical, people with medical kinds of background, hospital, community-based. So step care is not a new concept. I didn't invent it. It's been in, in the medical space for a long time, um, particularly uh, between, um, I think, probably nursing, primarily uh, nursing primary care, or psychiatry in the mental health space. Um, in the UK, uh, a lot of development from their National Health Service. Been, they've been doing this for 20, 30 years. And, um, the, that particular model is more medical model uh, in the sense that um, it's based on on, on level of um, sort of pathology and uh, but the principles are similar to what we do that it's well the goals are reverse the um, reduce the burden of mental illness in our society we want our society to be more productive and not so affected by um, this kind of distress when it doesn't when it gets in the way of functioning relationships and and productivity. And uh, the second goal is to have a system that's self-corrective. Now, we've all heard the term health system. What's systematic about it? Especially in Ontario, what's systematic about your health system? It's not really, it's, a, it's very decentralized. And so, so, sometimes that's good because it stays close to the community, allows community strategy to go. But it's a bit chaotic in terms of how it's organized from the top. And my fear is that, that your current administration might just be paying lip service to this idea and it might just be cost saving versus we're actually gonna try and create a system. What we're finding and what they found in the UK is having, thinking about a system not so much just to control costs or not to control costs at all, but, but really to um, be adaptive and have um, this idea of failing forward, which is part of learning, part of healing, um, but also part of your system. So the system needs to be self-corrective. And once there's, there's ways to have that at different levels. It can be in an encounter with an instructor that, you know, so I often say to an instructor who's worried about a student, you know, um, you, you've, have, you, have you listened to a student? You know, have you sat down and given them some time? And no, oh, I, I thought maybe I should just refer them. Okay, you, you could, but you know, when, are, are you comfortable talking to them? Try that out. Yeah, sure, I can talk to them. Okay, we'll try that out and see how that works. And you know, you can always call me back. So, so maybe that'll fail. And so you can have that sort of fail forward happen in the community with supporting people. We can have fail forward in our clinical work. Hey, you know, um, I've only spent 30 minutes with you. I've got a couple ideas of some things that might work. But you know what? Chances are they might not. And if they don't, come back. Your GP does this all the time. Um, you, quick sort of appraisal, there's a pain somewhere, or there, uh, I think it might be a, um, a, a um, um, some kind of um, infection. So what do we do? Antibi antibiotic, try this. If you're not better or if you have this reaction, come back and see me. So that fail forward there. But then, but then at the system level, it's like, um, let's try out this model, and uh, we're going to collect some data on it, because we're going to do some monitoring, and we're going to see which things are working better. 
Um, so maybe low intensity online therapy works, but unless we're monitoring it and comparing it to the other types of work that we're doing, we can't make the administrative decisions on, on, on what return on investment we're getting. We don't use monitoring to make our decisions both in policy very often or in care decisions. It's just sort of like we just assume that professionals, because they went to school, they're going to always make the right decisions. And, and our clinical judgment is the most important thing as, as professionals. But these monitoring tools can actually just improve our accuracy and our capacity. And not, not, just, our, not just our capacity to make good recommendations, but our capacity to experiment a little bit and make bad ones. Because guess what? If we, make, if we try something creative and it doesn't work, we're going to have this monitoring thing that will tell us right away so we can try something else. So, so it allows us to be more creative in our practice if we have an ongoing monitoring system. And business world knows this, right? I mean, sometimes it's annoying. You get all these surveys or asked to do these surveys after you buy something. And what's different about putting it into this space is if you involve people with the results and the monitoring, like, you know, people, some people, I like Fitbits, I like the tracking. If you, there's a way to have that monitoring be shared and it can be kind of fun to see and, and, and empowering to do it together. So, so our model is a, is a little bit different. Um, in the UK, so the UK doesn't focus on the rapid access. We focus very much on same day access for that reason of when someone's ready to do something, we have some way of getting them same day access. Does it have to be the counselor? Does it, I mean, there's different ways to do, it could, it, uh, it could be a peer. There's um, different configurations of this uh, um, in, the, in the post-secondary space. Um, um, I think, um, in the, I think the, the um, bigger universities have tended to have um, multiple pathways. Uh, they might have a single session clinic over here kind of thing and then they have their traditional counseling there. Smaller place, smaller um, um, colleges and universities with less resources try to, they don't have the option to have sort of both doorways and so they tend to try and um, uh, integrate these principles through their whole care system uh, and have single session principles there, but they might not have a single session clinic. So the rapid access is really important, but there's lots of different ways to do it. The recovery oriented part. So these are the recovery values. I don't have time to get into these, but you can, you know, if you click on, the, if you go in here, you can see a little short definition of what is part of part of recovery. Recovery, and I, m many of these principles we would uh, agree on. But one, this one here is um, is, is is central in that. What we try to do is bring in, um, if we're going to design a system, we put in some of these informal resources as a, as a legitimate part of our care system. And we, the experts, um, me, mental health experts, uh, part of our job is to be able to monitor this to see if it's working. Now, some of my colleagues say, oh my god, my liability goes way up if I prescribe or send somebody off to somebody that isn't um, trained. And you know. As long as it's informed consent, as long as your model is something that's transparent and, and everybody gets this idea that it's trial and error and buyer beware, then we can talk more about that later. Um, that's really empowering and it also doesn't um, patronize or, uh, you know, it isn't, it isn't um, assuming that, that our consumers um, need us to approve of everything because it's a shared thing and you know try this out hey you know it may not work you know it may, you may have a peer helper that's not very helpful let's uh, just like we um, part of what learning academic learning is about is how to use Google properly right it's amazing stuff out there I mean you know we don't really need our libraries for the books anymore because it's all online but what people need to learn is how to tell what is good stuff and what is bad stuff that's what our education system is about why should it be any different with health and wellness. So we need a structure that allows that kind of exploration. And recovery principles can help with that. Uh, what else was I gonna? Oh, model variations. Let me talk a little bit about that. <coughs> okay, so. Why don't I have Georgian in here? Do you see? I used to have Georgian in there, but I don't. Um, I got to get Algonquin in there, but let's take some of the, uh, uh, let's take George Washington, because it's really an interesting one. This is um, an elite institution in the US in, in Washington, DC. They were the first to adopt the memorial model. And um, 
This is very different from your context. So these are, this is, the tuition is $40,000 a year, U.S. Um, the factor in living expenses in Washington, D.C., that's about 70000 So these are people that either have, are lucky enough to get good scholarships, or in most cases, these are people from very wealthy families. And so um, the idea of um, building a, a care system that shortchanges people would not fly there. You know, because we expect, we are elite, we expect the best, and why are you sending my son or daughter to this self-help program? But it worked because um, the team, uh, the counseling team and the, the leadership got the recovery angle on this, that this is a way to promote um, uh, sort of independence, um, it, was, it fit with the academic rigor, that people are, people are going to be in, in control of their own life, and it's a shared uh, task. So. So um, it wasn't to save money, it was to build a better service model. And they, conf they liked it being circular, so you can, you can configure it circular. Um, UBC Vancouver, it's gotten a little busy, they've just adapted it a, a few more times. So they had me out and consulted with them and they decided to have this be more linear with um, you know, sort of more acute care stuff over here and self-help stuff down at that end. I know you can't read this. They've thought about who can you know, what might be the professional roles in here. Um, it might be not just one department, so you have accessibility advisors that are um, using part of these steps. So there's a place in many of these steps for, 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 for everybody, uh, including peers. And so that's a work in progress still. And what I say to campuses is, I would love you to be able to have a visual map of your model, your strategy. Uh, one page that sort of conceptualize it all because what we found in this implementation is that um, you need to be able to see the forest and the trees so the trees are the little pieces that everybody can play in here but you need to see that big picture and if you can't see the big picture at some point there is no system and if you if if you can't see the system how do you navigate it and how do you engage your stakeholders in the design unless you got something to react to? So I encourage people to try and draw this pretty quickly so that you can start having conversations about the parts and the whole. And what we're really trying to do with systems, any system, is um, produce synergy. And the definition of synergy is that the whole is uh, greater than the sum of the parts. And I just want to uh, pull on a little bit of um, uh, where do I have that? No, nope, not here. Collaboration. Uh, I want to touch on synergy. So a lot of international students, right? Um, so I'll just go through what is synergy and how it, how it fits with this model. So Step Care 2.0 is about, a bit that, about the, the map, about how do you pull everything together? How do you pull everybody that's in the community into this strategy of wellness? So this guy, Buckminster Fuller, architect, system theorist, designer, inventor. Um, anybody know where that dome is? It's in Canada. Anybody Montrealers here? No? <laughs> Expo 67, the um, geodesic dome there. It was uh, the American Pavilion back then. It's still there. Uh, it's in, um, I think, an amusement park called La Ronde now. It used to be called Man in His World. Um, so he, uh, Buckminster Fuller was, uh, he, he really loved this concept of the dome uh, because in, more in concept than practicality, it's, it's, a, it's the sort of most robust structure using the most minimalist of materials. And, and because of how they're organized, it is so strong and so efficient. And so what I'm encouraging people is, how do you build your dome here that has the most, the best combination of all the talents that you already have that produces something, a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. So I, I know I'm getting sort of philosophical and abstract, but this is an age old concept. So um, our ancient civilizations or ancient uh, communities, uh, Indigenous uh, wisdom draws on this. You look at the, uh, the simplicity of something like the TP, that it's round, it's got these very simple components that are really robust and flexible. You can take this thing down, you can move it around. So that's the kind of thing we want in our model. And we want it to be elegant. So 
I said it's getting a bit busy, that UBC one, so I think my colleagues in UBC would be fine with me throwing a little criticism. Maybe it needs to get more elegant. And, 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 but there's a challenge, because if you're trying to put everything in, how do you have all the trees in there without it looking busy? So it's, it's got to be a work in progress. Um, for inspiration, there are um, some thinkers that, that uh, and I'm just sharing this with you because they've been mentors for me early in my learning. So I'm a clinical psychologist, and if I just went through the normal clinical psychology path, I would not have been exposed to these folks. Um, Richard Katz, Dick Katz, uh, Harvard, uh, was a Harvard professor, studied with, uh, is there anybody as old as me in the room uh, or older? Timothy Leary, does anybody know Timothy Leary? So made a reputation on LSD and all that kind of things. Timothy went down the wrong path. He was originally a psychologist, did some brilliant work in psychology, um, and, um, but study was, he, Dick studied with some of the greats, and, but he went off the path, and he went to, um, he did a postdoc in anthropology. He's a clinical psychologist um, in Botswana and lived with the Kalahari Kung, and, and sort of pulled out some of these core concepts that form community and healing, and that the two are, are indistinct, right? Whereas in our medical system, we, healing is a medical thing and it's the absence of symptoms. That's not the, that's not the way it's thought of in more traditional communities. And I think in, in non-Western communities, there's less of a divide between community and, and mental health and healing. And that's often why international students won't come to our medical clinics. They're kind of going, well, wait, 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 I don't get it. Like, what? Like this is like I'm not crazy. Like why would I, you know, why would I do that? I'd, I'd rather just uh, when I want to uh, talk to somebody when I, I have a problem, I want to go to the expert, the the shaman, the healer, or whatever, and and I and I go when I need it. And so single session actually is is found to be quite attractive to to uh, um, people from more traditional or from non-Western communities. Jillian is the director of George Washington University's counseling center, and she I discovered. Also, I don't think it was at the same time, she was in Botswana with this tribe learning sort of these broad sort of principles of healing. And uh, so, you know, I think um, um, the reason she was successful at George Washington is because she could see the value of community in the healing process. So, that's the, so these, these folks inspired me not to just stick with my traditional training, but to think more broadly. So why, why is this important? Well, um, it's, it's a way to bring sustainability when you bring in the community. I love this um, um, uh, drawing by um, a um, um, artist in um, in Labrador, um, and because it it's bringing in the modern and the traditional, and so that's what we want to do here. Like we've got great <coughs> our training in psychology and counseling and social work and medicine, amazing stuff. But can we bring it together? Can we bring the windmill out? You know, it's out in the nature. Um, these concepts, circular concepts, the igloo or whatever you want to call it, nature. Let's bring these. Let's bring these things together. How we do that? Is it's 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 a little tricky, right? I mean, but it's it's. Uh, but if we create a model and a space for everyone, and and then, and then we bring in monitoring. Um, I was, I just put in a a, a proposal um, to CIHR a couple of months ago, and um, I got connected with a. Um, a chief in a Saskatchewan First Nation um, who, um, uh, Cadmus, Chief Cadmus DeLorme, uh, and he, um, the reason that I was introduced to him is because he said um, in our communities, in our indigenous communities, um, lots of resources are poured in, uh, but nobody's monitoring. Nobody, and nobody's monitoring the traditional healing. Nobody's like, okay, just because it's traditional doesn't mean it's going to work. And he said, let's, let's, can you, I want to be part of this project because what you're going to bring in is mo continuous progress monitoring, see if it works. And that both the patient and the clinician and the traditional healer and then everybody can be part of seeing, is, it, is this working? Is this, it, this investment in architecture working or this sort of synergy thing working? And if not, we'll, we'll adjust it. So here's the dome again, and with StepCare 2.0, all these little things that are going to populate this dome are, are, are components. In Newfoundland, a lot of change to this all-party uh, uh, report. Like, I can't remember how many recommendations. I think it's over 100 recommendations. And, and then staff and the community were kind of, oh my god, there's so much change, how are we we're getting overwhelmed? And so I was brought in to say, how can we see the forest here? How can we see the big concept? 
and it gets easier to manage all these components if you agree on some principles. And if you get inspired by some big ideas, maybe this one doesn't do it for you, the dome, but maybe you will have something like that that kind of says, okay, I see how all these parts fit in. So case management, uh, healthy campus is somewhere up there. We have a program called Green Mindfulness. We never thought that would, like, where did that come from? It was, we had um, our botanical gardens director happened to be a, um, a horticultural therapist and had worked in hospital settings. And he came to the counseling center and said, look, um, I'd like to work with you. And we had some people in our counseling center that loved mindfulness. And so they got together and they did this green mindfulness thing out in open space. So got a cafeteria out there. So it'd be out in space near there. From the botanical garden, they'd bring cuttings, mint leaves, they'd make tea. And um, so around campus, this became a place where, oh, did you hear about the place you can go get that plant? And so they, people come, we'd have 50, 100, 150 people show up, and then they, they kind of get mindfulness. They didn't know they were going to get it, but there's actually a meditation process going on, pay attention <laughs> to the mint leaves. So one of our most successful things, and it was because we brought these components together that are based in our community and we valued them as, as, as potential for healing. Knit and talk, this was in central Newfoundland. Uh, I can't remember which community there. As we started to work with the professionals and the stakeholders, the patients, we were asking, well, what are some of your natural community resources? Oh, there's Knit and Talk. What's Knit and Talk? Well, a bunch of, um, I think it was mainly women who were older that they <laughs> get together and they knit and they talk. And so now they're starting to prescribe that as, you know, like, hey, why don't you go to Knit and Talk? And now that involves taking a risk because in my training, I was told not to do that because what if there's a psychopath out there? But then as I learned that the world isn't that much of a dangerous place and this is probably better to take these risks than, than not to, I've, I've become more comfortable uh, with that. But that's where you need your administrative buy-in. You know, if, you're, if your administrator says or your government says, no, that's okay, you can send people off to knit and talk, guess what, you can send people off to knit and talk. But if they, if they say, oh, no, no you're, you're, you know, we won't support, we're not gonna back you up if that goes south. Um, one last thing. Oh my God, I've gotten myself lost here. Here we are. Um, for people who like policy, this is a, a, a thought-provoking book, um, Beyond the Risk Paradigm in Mental Health Policy. And I love this quote from here. So we need to shift the risk paradigm. We need to kind of get out there and stop being afraid of mental health because that's the thing that stigmatizes us the most when we say, oh my God, what if this person's suicidal? We better get them to the professional. That stigmatizes us. And in fact, in Newfoundland, in our residences, we had two suicides two years in a row, the same week, third week in March, uh, on the, in the same tower of this residence built, building, fifth floor, a um, female by hanging. Um, we, all, the, all the staff had for years been trained in um, risk assessment, mental health first aid. Uh, our risk management people said, um, oh God, there's too much drinking. Get all that drinking out of the residence. So, um, uh, and so of course, what happens, they go, downtown now and they drive and they drink and drive and whatever so that didn't really work um, and and there's actually nothing fun to do anymore in residence so we had all these staff being very very serious and, and inadvertently what we were saying is guess what you're the only ones that are going to prevent the next suicide because you you got to detect whether someone's hanging themselves from their shower and you know all well-intentioned right we think we're doing the right thing by equipping everybody with this risk assessment thing. these are young kids being burdened with this idea that somehow they're going to prevent a suicide and so what was missing was kind of fun and all the stuff in the community. There's, there's this um, fairly new buildings. They have these um, multi-purpose rooms, They're big, big empty rooms. There was nothing in it. Um, multi-purpose rooms became the hive of activity in the postvention following the suicide. All the kids would come in there and they'd, they'd all be getting together and be crying and then, then we'd bring in the puppies and they'd say, bring in the, the psych squad, the counselors, and the counselors are standing there awkwardly. Like nobody really wants to talk to us. But, but, but you know, afterwards when we reviewed this, it was like, we need something upstream. Like, uh, how come this is not a games room? How come nobody's having fun? Oh, we're too busy <laughs> taking our jobs too seriously, trying to prevent the next suicide. And you can imagine these kids that are going around saying, are you okay? And then what they're doing is, um, uh, to, to be cautious, they're sending anyone that's like just the least bit odd, uh, you better go to counseling. And then they report them because that's what our risk managers say. You better report them to the staff because you're not trained enough to do this. And so then, of course, anyone that really was suicidal is not going to talk to you anymore. So step back, take a breath, and uh, we need to take more risks. That's what this says. And, and uh, whoops, 
just uh, leave you with one graphic here. Uh, so, mostly the world is getting better. Uh, there's one that I find really fun. This is war from 1400. So, you know, World War II, World War I, big spikes. But, you know, there's actually less war than there, than, than there, there uh, uh, ever has been. And, uh, and, even, but, and uh, even, even suicide rates, like I said earlier, are, are fairly stable. Terrorism's going down. It peaked way before 9-11. But we wouldn't know it, right? There's, there might be a terrorist on campus. Yes, there might be. But if we're so preoccupied with that, we are going to compromise our ability to be creative and create these synergistic healing healing communities. Um, the last thing that I'll leave for you is what we really want to do is invest in campus activities, upstream, wellness, all of everybody being comfortable saying, hey, are you okay? You know, like we used to do. We'd talk to our neighbors. We faculty and staff would talk and they wouldn't we think it's a good thing that we're referring them, but I'm suggesting it's not. Um, Unless you've tried being naturally helpful and listening, then refer. And that, but that's not the message we've, uh, admittedly, unintentionally given um, to our communities. Because then what we're losing is this capacity of so many people, whether it be peers and students, to, to be part of the solution, whether it be policy people designing curriculum. This is where you're going to get a big return on investment. We actually get very little return on investment from our emergency wards, our psychiatric hospitals, our psychiatrists. Um, they, they can kind of help stabilize, but they don't make people better. Sending someone to the hospital, they don't get better going to the hospital. They, get, they actually get worse. So you might be able to, in that secure environment, keep them from killing themselves right then. As soon as you let them out, whoop, all bets are off because you've, you don't have this, this foundation of support. That's where we have to invest. We still need people up there, but shifting those experts to help manage this is what is, is um, and design this and facilitate design, co-design, is 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 what we're encouraging with Step Care 2.0. So that so I gave you broad brush strokes. I'm sure we're out of time. Any questions? <coughs> yes. Maybe a, we should share this. Yeah, just it <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I almost knocked over you. I just want to. S okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I not ask? <laughs> you want to ask? This is. It's just a conversation between me. Okay. And me. So what I understand is central to this step model is a holistic viewpoint of healing. Mm -hmm where the community is doing more of the supports and the professionals are targeting more of the um, more difficult, more cases, right? That's, that's kind of how I see yeah. it. Uh, so you mentioned that senior management buy-in is essential to making this work. Mm -hmm. And senior management thinks in a way of risks, right? Risks and rewards. Yeah. And part of the risk is uh, that this model requires greater training of those who not yeah. necessarily have had the experience yes. or the practice and the roles that they'll be given. Yes. Um, so how do you manage those, um, that training? That's like, such who, who, like who does it and that kind of thing? Well, like, it's just how do you look at that? Because yeah. if that's not done correctly, there could be harm. Mm -hmm. Because you are working with vulnerable people and if, if your approach is ineffective or if it's incorrect, yeah. you can create more damage than healing and good. And that's essential to this field, right? That's why things have been done yeah. the way they've been done. Sort of. I, I, yeah, I agree with you. We don't want to do harm. We can't do harm. But they came, we borrowed that from the medical field. Um, surgery does, can do real harm. Medications can do real harm. Um, most people who are um, listening and talking, well, they could trigger by saying the wrong thing. It's not like surgery that's going to cut an artery and kill somebody. Now, you might say, well, it could lead to suicide. But I think the risk paradigm that I'm trying to get you to shift is 
you know, actually people are more resilient than you think. Even in, in some ways, when we worry so much that people are so fragile, that if somebody they list, tries to listen to them, it doesn't work, and if we think that that's going to actually lead to a suicide, I think we're underestimating the capacities of people who are vulnerable. So I don't want to assume that people who are vulnerable can't take risks as well. But back to your point about um, we need, we need um, uh, resources and a, a, a management system that allows us to fail forward safely. And so monitoring is key. So you've got to, everything we do, we've got to have a way of monitoring them. There's an there's a, um, organization called EAB, Education Advisory Board, in Washington, DC. And um, many uh, Canadian institutions at the, at the senior level have um, uh, a kind of contract with them. Uh, and it's focused on retention. They do a lot of work helping institutions to retain students. They have a student success um, collaborative uh, um, program, which actually sets up a dashboard uh, in your, reg your registrar's office, admissions office, and increasingly will have elements of well-being in it. Will be separate from counseling and health because you need that to be um, sort of secure and confidential. But the whole idea with this three, these three dashboards is that um, in in students will have a portal where they can um, they can see how they're doing and they can get push notifications out to them when their grades are slipping and well, maybe you need to go see such and such. Um, you can put a well-being protocol in there that would, uh, and this is what we're working on with Memorial, that staff and, and faculty would have sort of some guidelines for how to support students. And, but it also has a kind of a, a tracking system. And you, know, you need to be careful with information because it's confidential. But th those are all being looked at very carefully with all stakeholders, students involved. Most students are, students are often not the ones that say, I have an issue with this information. They want people to have the information. Now, sometimes we could say as older, more <laughs> people with life experience, be careful with your information. But they're already putting it out on social media anyway. So let's get in the game and have a system that allows us to do that and allows us to monitor and fail forward. So we, yeah, yeah. So, so it, you're right to raise that concern. But I think as a profession, I know I was trained a bit to be too cautious. And that is stigmatizing too, because it assumes that our vulnerable people with trauma can't handle stuff. And, and some people say, well, this is not going to work for trauma. In fact, um, many of the people that are working on this model say this is very trauma informed. Um, some of the best work with trauma now is, is not so much focused on, on the attachment issues in the long term and the sort of vulnerability stuff. It's pulling more on strengths, uh, the strengths that people get out of those trauma experiences. But it's, a, but it's a good question. That's the thing we have to, um, will you be here th this afternoon? Are you part of that team? OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that I hear from my colleagues. They're great questions that we have to work through. But I believe there are answers to that. I think yeah. so. I just think it's, yeah. Got to, we got to, be, got to be careful. But we don't want that. that That's that, the education of the school, right? We don't want the caution to get us too nervous, like those students in residence. Too nervous. Um, you had counselors in there that had lots of training, and they're all nervous. That doesn't set a great environment for people with, with vulnerabilities. Other questions? But I love those hard questions. I mean, we have to, we, this, is, this has got to be a struggle. We need those, we, um, to your leaders that are bringing in something new, give them those challenges. But what I say to the leaders is when somebody gives you the challenge, turn it back and say, OK, what's the answer? We got it? Help me fix it. We have to do. We have to do better. I think. I think. Well, that's what we're here for, right? What we're on this planet for, <laughs> aren't we? Or are we just? Uh, we're just gonna. We're here to go through the motions. That's what life is. <laughs> that's not much fun. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So you talk about the engagement of faculty and being able to have the conversation with the student. And I guess my question for you is. Um, when faculty are feeling overwhelmed by yeah. workloads, uh, volume, and complexity, yes. and sometimes they are fearful of starting the conversation um, because that conversation may go down a path right. that 
really is outside of their comfort zone, and then they're not able to draw a limit or a boundary or redirect because they don't have the yeah. skill sets necessarily, um, and they're left in a position of vulnerability themselves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think one thing I've noticed is that faculty don't like to be vulnerable. That is a you know, they're in a leadership position um, in their classroom, they're the expert, and so engaging in conversations that are maybe outside of their comfort zone um, might put them in a position of vulnerability, and um, and then that's not what they signed up for. Nope. <laughs> um, and so yeah. I'm just wondering, like, what had, in your experience has been effective um, in supporting faculty to be engaged? Because, I mean, I get where they're coming from. Yeah. So, for, so first of all, we work with people that are um, at a presentation like this. For the, we start with the people that kind of go, oh, that's really cool. I want to. Well, who, so who are your potential champions? So we don't sort of push this down and say, well, now guess what? Every instructor has to do this. Um, so it's sort of voluntary. And then sometimes the champions will then, you know, it'll it'll sort of rub off on others, and, and folks will join. So this idea that making this prescriptive that all of a sudden now this is your job. No, that's, that's not what we're trying to do. So that's one angle. But the other angle is that many um, staff and faculty um, have, just like people who come to a single session clinic, um, they are, um, they see a problem. They don't, their students are all distressed or, you know, I don't, I don't know what the, pro like, I don't know how to handle this, it's disruptive in my classroom. So, you know, at those moments where they're interested, where they put up their hand and say help, now they might be putting up their hand saying, you take this off my, you know, <laughs> um, workload or whatever. Um, but those are moments of opportunity to, to sort of engage and see how, as, as um, clinicians in our um, center, uh, I think of my role not just to serve students, but to, to serve the faculty. And now I'm not gonna give them therapy, but I will spend a lot of time with them, trying to understand and, and, and get to know their experience and find a, a point where they might be able to have a contribution to that. Um, so building those relationships, when the faculty says, I've got a problem here, um, resist the temptation just to s sort of take the problem away from them. But, but um, you know, maybe you take it away from them, but then you sort of follow up with them. You build that relationship, that one that says, I've got this disruptive student, can you fix it? So yeah, maybe you fix it first. But then you go back and you say, hey, you know, how's that going? And so you form that relationship. So, so faculty are often very, um, so many of them are introverts. They might be very isolated. They, their mental health may not be that great. So we, when we're building this strategy, we want, we want you know, something to be in it for them. So if you're doing something like green mindfulness or mindfulness training, why not? You know, it doesn't have to be just for students. If you're, if you're getting an online program, get, connect with your HR department. Make sure that this, this, all this stuff is for, is for everybody. Um, maybe, they, maybe they'd like to learn um, some peer um, you know, take some peer training and some of them, some of the champions. So I know it's not a, a simple answer, but I think we got to get out of our silos. Um, and of course, we're not going to provide counseling or therapy to, to our staff or faculty. I don't think you do that, right? Um, but a better relationship with HR, because, and, and who's the AAP provider? You know, maybe they might, like AAP providers, they've known step care forever, mainly to make money, you know, how to do the cheaper stuff. But they, they also are very interested in seeing how um, this can actually do, um, um, do this, this, this lower blue stuff, not just to make money, but because they'll, get be they'll have more contracts. People are going to invest in something that works. So, so bringing all your stakeholders together to, to build this, I think, will help get more staff and faculty on board. And then the final thing I'll say about staff and faculty is, um, a good teacher is somebody who is mindful and in the moment. So, um, you know, I don't think a presentation like I do works for, uh, in this room today, works for everyone. Not everybody likes it, but usually when I'm having fun <coughs> teaching or talking to people, I'm more engaging. And the same thing happens for instructors. We can help them to be engaged with, with their, their instruction, with their research, or whatever it is they're doing, you know, um, Siloing that out and saying, oh, we don't do that? That's EAP? There's a lost opportunity. Happy to also, to, anybody wants to continue the conversation by email or, you know, I, I, I'm interested in hearing people's reactions and criticisms because that's how we build a better uh, um, sort of concept and step care 2.0 becomes 3.0.
Thank you, Peter. So the rest of us are going to move to another room, but uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.